Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is John Dickinson. I am. Uh, I work on the OpenStack project, specifically I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, which is an object storage system. Uh, it's conceptually similar to Amazon S3. Uh, and this is, and part of that I was um, on the original development team and have been working on that for about the, five, uh, the past five years. Uh, and currently I work at a company uh, based in San Francisco called SwiftStack. And this is interesting for me because why, why is this talk the one that I want to give? What is this talk? Uh, I'm very comfortable and, and familiar with giving talks that go into great technical depth about various things related to large-scale distributed object storage. Uh, that's not what this talk is about. Uh, when, I guess one of the hardest problems that I have experienced is especially with open source projects, is to figure out how to get people to work together on a common goal. And I think it's especially hard for something like OpenStack because there are so many people and it's so large. There's a lot of different organizations and processes uh, going in there. And so this is something that we uh, have been doing. And uh, specifically, I want to share a story about that, uh, our, my experience with that. So uh, working with about two dozen devs over the course of uh, a full year, spread across about four different continents, uh, we were able to work together to get a feature done. And it was challenging, and it was also rewarding. And it's overall just been a huge privilege to work with all of the Swift contributors. Uh, they're incredibly smart, talents, mature, talented, and mature, and just nice. And so it's, it's been very nice. Uh, but the, the difference for me is that as a developer and someone with a developer background, I oftentimes look for that technical solution for a problem. So it's, that's fine, but the, the open source world has a lot of challenges that aren't really technical in nature. Or you may have technical tools that help you, but that's not really the, the true solution. Uh, the, the hardest thing here, I think, was just the whole people problem. And uh, when we were, um, so let me tell you a little bit about what Swift is, the feature we did, and kind of the story of how we built uh, this big feature together. So first off, just as a very brief overview, uh, what is OpenStack Swift? Uh, as I said, it's a uh, large-scale distributed object storage system. It's conceptually similar to Amazon S3, except it's open source. You can deploy it across wide geographic areas, uh, and it is... Uh, essentially, though, and importantly, it's, it's a system, it's a storage system that is going to be able to separate your data from the media upon which it is stored. And that gives you some really cool advantages when you're looking at trying to solve storage problems. It means that as your media comes and goes, whether or not it was intentionally because you upgraded or unintentionally because you had hardware failure, you don't lose access or uh, durability to your data. And at the same time, you can offload a lot of the hard problems of storage to uh, the storage system itself. You don't have to deal with concurrent access and locking and uh, uh, scale issues and hardware failures and working around all that kind of stuff. You can just kind of treat the storage as a utility. So it's got a, it's got a nice uh, API that's fairly simple. It's based on HTTP. It's not very chatty, which means that you can actually use it across wide geographic areas. And it's multi-tenant. Um, uh, which means that you can uh, pool a lot of stuff and get a lot of uh, efficiencies of scale. And it integrates perfectly with the rest of OpenStack so that you can put it in part of a very broad uh, cloud solution for what you need. So that's basically kind of what Swift is. And I'm not going to talk any more about how that works or what's going on. But I do want to talk about the feature that we worked on. <clears throat> Excuse me. What are storage policies? So storage policies are... The biggest thing that ever happened to Swift since the whole thing was open sourced uh, about four and a half years ago. So just a very little basic elevator pitch of what storage policies are. Swift allows you to have a globally distributed storage cluster. Storage policies allow you to do a few things with that. You can, given your global footprint of hardware, you can, um, you can segment the data and choose what piece of, what subset of hardware your data is stored on. So if you have two data centers, for example, in the United States, you might have one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. 
Uh, and it may be that inside of there you have different classes of storage. And storage policies allow you to, um, uh, to identify those. And from a sysadmin perspective, it means that you are, um, you're very able to you're able to expose the, the actual truth about what your storage is and expose particular capabilities that are available in some subset of your hardware. From a, from a developer, it means that you can actually put data where it should go. So you know that this is going to be hot content, so you can put it in something that's more performant. So you know this is something that uh, needs to be available everywhere, so you can put it in a storage policy that spans geographic regions rather than staying in a particular region. So that's kind of how it works, uh, or generally uh, what's going on there. And it's, it's a really big deal, and it's a foundation for new features that we're doing uh, in the future. So, for example, uh, right now, Swift is a replicated storage system, but we're currently implementing non-replicated storage, uh, for uh, erasure codes specifically. And this is built on top of storage policy, so that's one particular storage policy. So, again, that's the context we're going in. So now, leaving aside the tech of what, what we actually built, how it actually works, the question is, okay, how did this happen? What's the story? So it starts off, of course, with an idea at some point. And it's really fun talking to people about what, where did this idea come from and, and what, was the, what was the genesis of this thing called storage policies in our broad community, which I'll talk about in a little bit, the, what the community looks like. So we start with the idea. And there's a few things. First off, the, uh, the OpenStack community uh, has regular summits where all of the developers from around the world gather. And one of the great things about those summits, just like one of the great things that I love about LCA, is that you have a great hallway track. You go to lunch with somebody, you meet somebody in the hallway, and you start talking about things. And that's really where a lot of the good ideas come from. And you're like, hey, you know, we should work on this. I'm having this problem. How do we fix that? That kind of stuff. So there were some developers who were eating lunch together at one of the summits. And they started talking about it and saying that, you know, it would be kind of nice that instead of saying that every piece of data that is stored in a cluster, no matter how broadly distributed, um, right now it's, it's all stored the same. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if we could kind of control how these different subsets of data were, were stored? Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you could put your image thumbnails in reduced replication and you have your backups maybe uh, a little more durably stored or, or something like that? Now... That was, that was kind of an interesting idea people talked about. It's like, yeah, that's a really good idea. Somebody should work on that. Uh, well, a little bit later, after, after that summit, um, I told you I worked for a company uh, called SwiftStack, and I was with uh, some other people at SwiftStack, and as, as you do at a company, uh, you go to potential customer sites, and you ask them what they need, and what, what is it going to take to convince them that they should give you money for your product? And so I was on one of these things. I was talking to a potential customer, and they started telling us uh, about their storage needs and kind of the, the scale they needed, the, the dispersion they needed, and, and uh, these sort of things. And they started asking us about erasure codes. And they said, we really need this. And we ran some numbers, and it turned out they did really need this because in their particular hardware and sc scale and all that kind of stuff, it would literally save them a million dollars a month. And so we look at it and it's like, well, that's, that's a million really good reasons to work on erasure codes. So what we did is we took that back to the office and we're kind of talking about it and figuring out what, what would it really take? Because, you know, I'd really like to land this customer. So what does it take for us as a company to actually implement this? Uh, what do we have to do upstream in Swift? And at the same time, we have some of the people who were part of that lunch conversation back at the summit uh, listening in and talking, and so we're, we're sketching it out. It's like, okay, what does this mean? Well, it turns out that erasure codes, while being very nice, certainly not good for every single use case, and it's extraordinarily unlikely that somebody's going to need to build a Swift cluster that is only going to support erasure codes. Uh, just as we were having customer requests that were saying that, well, I don't want only replication. So the point is, you need to have both, and there wasn't any really good way to do that. And so we realized what we needed is a way to have a policy, a storage policy, that would allow us to define this is how this kind of data is stored and where it's stored, and this is how that kind of data is stored and where it's stored. And so that's how it kind of started coming, coming around. It was you know, casual developer conversation, a lot of communication back and forth there, and then it was, it was talking with uh, customers and potential customers about saying, uh, what is it that you need and how can we help do this? So, that's kind of where we started. It's like, you know, we need this thing called erasure codes eventually. 
And we need to, it seems like what we need is something called uh, storage policies first. So at that point, we have to look at what else is going on. Because the truth is, nobody within uh, our, our project uh, and any open source project is operating alone. There are multiple people there. So you need to figure out, even if it's a small project, but especially in, in big ones, what are other people working on? So it's important to relate these new features that we're working on with the other things that are going on. And the people who are actively involved currently, or at the time when storage policy started, and have been working on things, uh, and are just are some very large companies, some very small companies, and figuring out how to tie that together was, was really important. So uh, the point is we needed to put that in the context of this cohesive story. So there was one thing that was going on that was pretty important at the time, and that was something called disk files. And disk files, uh, looking into a little bit of the implementation of, of Swift, uh, when, when you talk to a storage node inside of Swift, and that storage node is responsible for actually persisting data to a disk, that goes through a, a small abstraction layer called a disk file that allows you to kind of swap things out and, and say that, hey, if, if the disk behaves in this way, we can do it that way. Uh, we can write some code to handle that. Um, and, it, and it's a good thing. So we needed to capitalize on this current work that is going on at the same time. Now, I heard this quote recently. I read it online. Uh, two should... Um, one key for encouraging community development in open source projects is to build your architecture around modularity and option value, which basically means give people a reason to work on it. You, the lesson here that we had, this is kind of like the lesson learned in this particular thing, is you need to see the relations of what's going on and find friends there. Don't try to fight against things. So. One of the companies that's very interested, that got very in, interested in this was Intel. Intel's job is to sell CPUs. That's what they are in business to do, and that's how they stay in business. So in that sense, what you needed to do is provide a story for Intel so that they can continue to sell CPUs and they can see the current work that they're doing within the open source project as a way for them to sell more CPUs, because that allows them to actually continue to devote, devote time, effort, money, people to the open source project. At the same time, the company I was working for, SwiftStack, we need customers. So the thing that we want to do is we want to look at this in the context of if we spend time on this, is that time going to be spent in a way that we can get more customers and uh, as opposed to other things? So the point is here is that we want to design things in such a way that we can provide the value that they need, but also allow the other people who are in the ecosystem to actually see their own value and extract their own value from it uh, in the way that they want to. So we're not trying to trick anybody into working on something. We're not lying to them about, you really should work on this, wink, wink, uh, because it's going to be good for you. You're, you're telling them a story that is, that is completely true and accurate, but you're helping them see that in a way that actually, that it is in their own self-serving interest. So. Um, you need to give them a reason to work on it. So the way we do that, uh, going back to what else is going on in the community and tying that together, is you need to put it together as kind of one story, one vision of this is what we're doing, this is where we're going to go, and you're a very important part of making this happen. And very specifically, this is how you're, a, uh, you're, you're an important uh, member of the community and helping that work. So in this case, I, I mentioned the disk file work. <clears throat> this is something that uh, was largely spearheaded by Red Hat. And it's very easy to look at this and say, you know what, this disk file work is actually really important for providing a lot of the abstraction layers that we need in order to implement storage policies. Your work is very, very important. And so if you can continue that, you're actually helping not only yourself, because you're working on this to help ex uh, add your own extensibility points, but you can also help out the rest of the community and be good community citizens. So the, um, the other side, you can look at it as the other contributors. Let's say uh, people like HP and, and uh, Rackspace who have very large production clusters. The thing that is paramount for them is production stability because they have literally tens and hundreds of thousands of customers on these clusters today. So what they need to do is be able to see their, their perspective and their vision part of this overall story. 
It's like, you know what? We're going to make this. It's awesome right now. We're going to make it, make it more awesomer. And the reason that you are a critical part of this is because your experience on your day-to-day of running this production cluster ensures that we can continue to keep this thing production ready and stable and, and things like this. This is, this is actually crucial to us implementing a new feature. Even if you're not the one typing the code, you are still an in 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 incredibly important part of this community because without your influence and without your expertise and without your wisdom, you, we are going to fail. So if I go do this but I don't have access or uh, insight into something, somebody else's production and cluster, then it makes it very, very hard for me to actually um, account for those sort of use cases. So the point is, the lesson that I had to learn here and that we did, we did here is to, is to build this story and show how these things are tied together and show how the community actually works together. Don't, don't just assume that everybody understands how they fit in and how it works and, and where they fit in overall and why, why they're important within the community. And uh, that's, that's even more important as the communities get bigger. So what's next? You've got this big story. The next thing you have to do, and it's almost an allergic word to uh, a lot of uh, technical and especially developer people, people, is that you need to sell the story. And in this specific case, yeah, we need to sell that customer prospect because they need to say, you know what, that's really kind of interesting. Um, let's keep talking to you. That gives us a motivation to continue working on it. Also, very, very importantly, we have to actually sell the contributor developer community. We have to say that you can, you should be working on this, and here's why. Uh, sometimes I joke uh, that within uh, OpenStack, the, the PTLs, the project technical leads for each of their respective projects, they're are responsible for delivering features and coordinating things. They're managers, except they can't actually hire anyone, fire anybody, or actually even tell anybody what to work on. So it becomes very challenging in the kind of that whole herding cats mentality. So the point is, though, you still have to, if you can't tell somebody to do something because you're paying them, then you need to be able to sell them on that story. And so people want to be a part of that story and say, what's going on? And part of what that means is you start talking about things publicly. This is an open source project, so don't do things in a, in a secret, behind closed doors way, but start talking about it publicly. And here's something that was uh, done and just terrifying for most developers, myself most of the time included. Go write a blog post about it. So you know what, here's this feature, and here's how it's going to work, and here's what we're working on. What that means is you've generally just started selling everybody and telling everybody you're working on this thing and you haven't even written a line of code for it yet. And all of the developers start cringing because they're like, I don't know if it's actually going to work and I don't know how to do it. And this is something radically new that's never even been done before. So I don't have any idea, much less how to do it, but even when it's going to be done. And so it's it's horrifying from a developer perspective, but it's, but it's actually good for the community. There's, there's a lesson here that there's both danger and, and reward in doing something like that. The danger is that, I'll come back to this a couple of times, but the danger is that you can't really hide anything in open source. Nobody, it's not a surprise that somebody's working on something for anybody who actually wants to look and see what's going on. That's kind of the point of it being open. Which means that it's very possible for somebody who's not involved to actually get in there and start talking about the thing you're working on, which means that they are almost controlling that message and telling people, this is, this is what we're doing, and they're not even part of it. So if you're actually working on it, you need to, act, you need to be in, in control of that message. So if you're the one who's going to be working on it and trying to lead this development effort in your open source project, then you're the one who should be telling people about what you're working on. Don't, don't leave that for somebody else to do. And I think that's very hard for us as developers and as operators and technical people sometimes because we think that it's, it's almost cheating or we're just making things up or we're, we're selling something that we don't actually have. And the truth is, though, the, the, the strength, the advantage here is that it actually helps keep people honest because it, it makes it harder for a company or a person who has stepped forward and said, this is what we're working on, to actually then later step back because now there's more eyes looking at them. And they can, uh, th there's more almost social pressure for you to keep working on it and, and actually make something that's good. You can't kind of give up halfway and say, oh, well, mm, never mind, sorry, guys. Um, so um, I think that's it. There's kind of a, a double-edged lesson about um, 
selling that story out there. You have to make sure that you're the one who's in control of your message. Don't let somebody else tell your story for you. But at the same time, uh, being doing that helps you stay accountable to the rest of your community. To, it helps you be a better citizen in your own open source community. So before I keep going, I want to tell you a little bit about how our community is put together within the OpenStack Swift project. Um, there are obviously developers, people who are typing in code. And when uh, they type in code, they submit a patch. And the patches are then reviewed. And we've, in, inside of the OpenStack project, we've got a, uh, a group of developers who are called core reviewers. And these are basically the people who have the commit bit. And they can click a button that sends it into a, a, a worker queue that uh, puts it, the, the CI system will run some tests against it. And if the, um, if the patch passes, then it, uh, it gets merged into the, uh, the master branch of the repo. The other important part, because I'm going to come back to this just as far as understanding where the community is, is that, at least with OpenStack, and, and this is my experience here, um, there are a lot of groups inside of what is from the external perceived as this is OpenStack. There's a lot of little groups in there. So the Swift development community is one. And another one would be the infra team, the infra, uh, OpenStack infrastructure team. They're the people who actually run the, the Garrett uh, installs and the, the Jenkins installs and putting together all the CI system and things like that. Um, and then the, the final thing to understand about how the community works is that every six months, OpenStack has a, an integrated release. And this is where every single OpenStack project, every single, every single OpenStack project part of the integrated release, cuts a release and ties it together. And it's a big deal for the OpenStack community, uh, especially because, in, in no small part because, uh, there's a lot of people who are not developers who start tying it together and advertising it, talking about it, and people talk about it in the press. There's marketing around it and things like that. So it's actually a really big deal that's, that's much more than just the, the tech part about it. So I'm going to come back to various pieces of those, but I think that's a kind of an important piece of, of what the community looks like. So the, last, uh, the other piece here is what does, a, uh, what does the life cycle of a Swift patch look like? Uh, and this is important to understand kind of as we did the development work and the release, you'll see uh, where this comes in. So you have an idea, you write some code, you submit it for review. You write some code to fix the things that were found in review, and you repeat that process until it's good. Then it's merged if it passes all the tests in the uh, automated system, and then you have a release. Obviously, there's a lot of feedback. There's a lot of these things going on all at once. Um, and the, uh, the contributors are the people who have this idea and have the code. And then, essentially, you've got the, uh, the core reviewers, the people who have that commit bit, are the ones who are doing reviews. There's more people do than that doing the reviews, but they're the people who can help it go to the merge step. Um, and then, so, so there's uh, the entire community and the core reviewers are doing the review. The core reviewers are doing the merge. And uh, for the sake of argument, although it's more nuanced than this, it is the project technical lead who is doing the release. So that's kind of how it flows and who's doing, who's doing the different pieces. So that's kind of where we're set up as far as the community, the patch that we worked on, and kind of that, those initial steps. We've gone through now the idea, and um, we've, got, we've, we've, got, uh, uh, we, we've sold the idea to the community. So who is actually working on this big feature for us? And this is, this is a lot more than just oh, you know, it was, it was Bob, and it was Susie, and it was, and it was Frank who were working on the, the, the actual typey typey parts. The, um, I, I, have this, I have this impression that inside of open source projects, we, we treat all of the, we, we, we pretend that all of the contributors are individuals. And they are individuals, of course. Um, they have their own hopes and dreams and, and stuff like this. But, but the reality is that we, the, the, the reality that we like to ignore is that these individuals have jobs and their employers like to tell them, this is what we think you should be working on. And we like to ignore that until we can conveniently blame some particular problem on either internal or external corporate politics. And in that point, we realize, oh yes, there are corporations here and they're evil. But, but the reality is that you cannot separate those and you can't ignore those. And this is part of the lessons I had to, I had to learn over, or I did learn um, in, in managing this kind of stuff for, for Swift. 
people have jobs and they have lives and they are interested in their career and they are doing OpenStack work and, or open source work as part of that. It's not a separate thing. They're not just, it, it's extraordinarily rare, I think, and, and definitely rare in the project that I am involved in, to have somebody who's only on their free time out there typing in extra code. So managing that community in that way, is, you cannot ignore that reality. They, um, you've got contributors, uh, you've got the people who are doing QA, you've got uh, those kind of people who are often in a completely separate group of, in, uh, of the organization in which they work that you don't maybe even interact with. Uh, you've got uh, dev managers, you've got project managers, you've got ops teams, you've got all of those at all of these companies. And sometimes even these companies compete with one another, and you've got to acknowledge that. Um, so I, I think the point is that when looking, and in, 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 our, in our case, uh, part, of the, part of my own lessons learned is that we have to, we have to acknowledge there are, there are companies, not just people. And these people work for companies is maybe a different way to say it. And, and try not to ignore that and, and realize what's going on. So when you're looking at who is actually working on this, yes, it's Paul who's working on it, but it happens that Paul is working for Intel. And there's a lot more behind it than just what we see in daily interaction. Happens to be that Matt is working on this, but Matt works for Rackspace. And that brings in a different set of concerns and, and work and, and things like that. And so we need to acknowledge that. That was actually, I think, a very important lesson learned for me is acknowledge who's actually working on that and who influences these people because that's managing an open source community you can't actually tell people what to do it's it's leading my influence and and coordinating by influence not by by mandate or by fiat okay Can you detect some sort of risk of the project being hijacked by a sort of corporate agenda? Yeah. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes just simply happen because it's people. When do you see that these things are happening? How do you turn it back? How you got the idea? I think that that's a. I think that's something to. I think by acknowledging who works where and not ignoring it until it's a pain point is actually a way to guard against somebody or hidden influencers coming in and hijacking your project. Uh, and the, I think the, the entire point, that if I had to put it down into three words of my entire talk, is communication is key. And everything that you're doing is facilitating the communication. And by hiding that communication or what's actually going on, um, you're going to be more likely to, to run that risk. So. In some ways, I think it matters that you have a diverse community so that you have more protection against that. But um, I, I think very simply, I would say that you have to acknowledge that. Don't, don't be scared of that and, and ignore it until it actually is a problem, but build it up in such a way that your community actually acknowledges that, yes, we have companies. Build this single, singular story and tie it together. Show how these companies working together actually benefits them better because they don't actually necessarily believe it, or at least everybody in that organization that you may not see. You have to convince their dev manager. I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit. So I think that's a great question and a very important point when you're doing especially with larger things. Um, so here we are. At this point in the story, we're doing the dev work. This is all the, all the months of spinning in, actually thinking really hard and typing in code and fixing the bugs. That's those four words. So the way we did this, uh, in this particular thing, uh, there's, there's some, obviously some very visible upfront sort of work that we could do. And then there's a lot of back-end work. So basically, you can think of things that actually impact the API. They give you your demos and your, uh, your ability to show you uh, your dancing ponies and things like that, the kind of stuff that sales guys really like. Uh, and then there's all the back-end stuff that actually makes it work and work well and makes it stable and makes it production ready and stuff like that. So in this particular thing, in this particular feature of storage policies, we chose to implement a lot of that flashy upfront stuff first. And then we ended up doing some of the back end stuff later. So in this case, we were able to very early give a demo of reading and writing uh, data into different storage policies. Now the problem is, just showing that demo 
was not taking into account any kind of failure or working around uh, miscommunications or coordination of timing that you have to do in this distributed system. Uh, and I think that what happened there is it felt like we had a lot of initial success and then everything really slowed down, which was a little bit hard to manage, especially as people are coming in and saying, you know what, I saw a demo four months ago. Are you done yet? How come you're not done yet? What's going on? Oh, hurry, hurry, hurry. And so I think that the, the lesson here and the, the thing that was extre extremely important was to continue to manage those expectations. Don't just tell them what's going on, but continue to report back on what is going on. Don't say you're, this is what you were working on and then go away until it's done, but continue to tell people, this is what we're doing. This is the kind of thing we're, we're working. You're still a valuable member and it's part of this overall story of where we're going and this is where we are. I don't know when it's gonna be done. It's gonna be done when it's done, but We've got, to, uh, we've got to manage those expectations so that people realize this is what you're doing. So there are a few things that actually helped us on this. Um, we, these, are, these are some examples of things that worked for us in our community, and I think it's very, two important points. Number one, don't cargo cult any tools that we used. Use the tools that work for you. The point is to facilitate communication. So in our particular cases, uh, case, we did a few things. One. We made a wiki page, and yes, it's just a wiki page, but it, it was tremendously useful, and it actually continues to be useful, and we're expanding on it uh, even now. So we made a, a singular page that everybody can know. We put it in the topic message of the IRC channel and said, these are the priority reviews, so that when contributors come into the community, they can look at it and say, oh, I need to look at this one first. Because the reality is there's dozens of patches out there, and hundreds overall, so how do you dozens of patches just for storage policies. And they've got different dependency chains and you don't know, is it still a work in progress? Is he, is he still gonna be working on stuff? What about tests? You know, how are these things working? Um, because that person's in a completely different time zone or on a different continent. And so we put together a priority reviews page that we could actually say, yes, this patch works first and then you should do this one and then you should do this one. And we wanna have these done by next Tuesday. Now, since storage policies has landed, uh, I've implemented another page, and I'm going to try to expand on this uh, in, in, the, in the months to come, is we've got right now a little ideas page, another little simple tool that allows new people to come in and say, you know what, I need something big, I need something tiny to work on. Um, what can I do? And so instead of having to look through bug queues and, and uh, specs or blueprints or all of these other, these other uh, artifacts we have within the OpenStack ecosystem, they can easily go to one thing and say, you know what, there's 10 things. Let me just pick one and see what I can hack on it. And it's gonna be things that are roughly um, you know, isolated things that aren't gonna necessarily impact major longstanding work, but they're also not gonna require uh, you to have extraordinarily deep knowledge of every point of the system before you can start touching it. Another thing we did is, I, I, I guess the lesson there is, help people know what to work on, both for developers and reviewers. So another tool we used is Trello. And this is a completely unofficial, unauthorized thing within the OpenStack community. We're just like, you know what? We need a way to track who's doing what, what's going to work on, and, and how do we do this? We didn't have something that work, was working very well for us on that. So we kind of went, went off and used a third-party tool. We didn't invent a new thing. Um, lesson here that I, I think I would, I would ask or, or share is that you should not be afraid of, don't be afraid to use something that works for you, even if it's different than other people are working on. Just be bold in that. Another thing that was very important was in-person meetings. Uh, despite the fact that we're a globally distributed community, in-person meetings were really important. And this has, this is much more often than those six month OpenStack summits that we have. Um, this, th there are costs and rewards here. Um, the, the cost is that people have to travel, and in some cases it's a very real, literal cost. Uh, and the risk is that it could potentially exclude people who are not able to take a week away from family, take a week away from uh, their, their business or whatever, and literally fly to a different country or continent. Uh, to spend a week. But that being said, it is something that we were doing and it's, uh, it, it was very, very good for us. Um, also, we had regular status updates uh, and I think the, the point on all of this is that we wanted to get into the default flow of, uh, the default workflow. Don't disrupt that. 
um, don't try to implement a new tool that is completely outside of what they're doing. It's like, you know what, all my dev work is over here, but if I want to figure out that thing, if it's completely outside of your workflow, then you're never going to pay attention to it. So make it, make it easy, and those, those tools, whatever tools you're build, building, it's facilitating the communication. And in a lot of ways, the communication isn't a technical problem. This is the kind of thing that say thank you, promote others, be helpful. Again, people are looking for their own career. They're going to say, you know what, I wanted to work on this. Yes, my company did this, but I don't want to... Most people are not trying to say, I want to work on this project for the next 20 years at this particular employer. Especially today, people are moving around all the time. They're wanting to look for uh, new jobs. They wanted to look for getting raises and things like that. So a very important piece here is that you need to give the contributors the tools they need so they can sell within their own organization. I think this goes to your question a little bit. It's not just, you need to work on this, but you know what, this is the kind of things we need to work on, here's why, and here's something you can give your manager. Or this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of story you can tell the, the product manager that you're dealing with, uh, who's working with the marketing people, to know actually what's going on. Why should you buy a plane ticket to fly out here? Because this is what we're doing, and, and don't just assume that people are able to eloquently um, uh, talk about what is going on in the community. Give them the tools they can do to do that. Help them out. And um, I think be visible about that. Don't don't just necessarily do that in secret. People are looking for um, people want to find recognition. They do that in different ways. Find something that works for people. Uh, sometimes that is saying thank you. Sometimes that is acknowledging that from a stage, and sometimes that, that's just doing something privately and giving them a little gift or something like that. It's not just the new people that need to know how to get involved. It's also the experienced people. People who have been around the project for years still need to know how to get involved today. And that kind of goes back to those, um, the tools that you need to facilitate that communication. So, the merge. We got the coding done. Now we had this massive, massive effort. The problem is, we, this, this feature was changing the heart of Swift. We touched enormous amounts of code. As of after the merge, after this merge, um, looking at uh, a slot count output, uh, Swift has about 85,000 lines of code, tests, things like that. If you take the diff for this merge commit and pipe it to WC minus L, it is 32,451 lines, 415 lines, and about two thirds of that are tests. Percentage-wise, it was an, it was a massive, massive effort. It was it was just the, it was, the sheer magnitude of it was overwhelming. So it was huge. So we had to do a few things. One, we had to spend a huge amount of time on on reviews for this thing. Basically, we froze development on anything else until this landed. We said, you know what? We think this is ready for the integration. This is huge. We had been working on a long-running feature branch, which was unusual. We had to work with that infrastructure team to get that set up and to get that working. Um, then we had to uh, work on getting that merged in. Now, there's a couple things here. One is the CI system, especially at the time in OpenStack, was tremendously, terribly slow. Our patch chain, I think, ended up being 28 patches long to get for storage policies. Uh, each, at the time, the CI system was going, I think, nearly a day. It was, something, it was something around 24 hours for one patch to land, which tells you that we're looking at a month, assuming there are no bugs in anything, before we can land this stuff, if we go the old way. So we had to, very work, we had to work with the, the, the other people who had access to things we didn't, just so we could say, let's land this merge commit and not other stuff. Um, so we needed help from that. Uh, another thing is, and this is a lesson I learned here, is that even with people who had been working on this, the classic bike shed problem we hit, uh, we put docs as that very first patch in the chain. So like, this is kind of what describing all these other patches. What that meant is every time somebody reviewed something, they look at the docs and they're like, oh, you know what, you've got a typo there. Or, ah, this is a little unclear, can we do that? And then you fix that because you've got a patch dependency chain, you end up having to rebase two dozen patches on top of that and it became very tedious. When we do this again for erasure codes, we are going to um, put those dots at the end. Um, so that was something that was um, 
uh, it, was, it was hard because it was a massive, overwhelming thing. So um, that's kind of how we did that. But I think an important point in here is you also release when you're ready. Don't try to push people too early to do this. I mentioned that we have very major integrated release milestones, or integrated releases for OpenStack. Um, right before uh, one of the releases, uh, the Icehouse integrated release, uh, we were almost done with storage policies, and we're looking and we were really trying to do that. But the truth is it wasn't ready. It was not sufficiently tested at that point for us to look at it and say, this is a release that we think you can run in production. So we didn't. And I will tell you from experience, that was fun um, when you get to go talk to a journalist and say, oh yeah, you know that thing we've been talking about for a year? It's not in this release. Well, why not? So I think a lesson learned here is that this was not a missed deadline. And the reason it was not a missed deadline is Inside of an open source project where you actually can't control very strictly when something is actually released, don't promise a release date. Don't tell somebody it's going to be done on Tuesday if you actually can't deliver it on Tuesday. Or like don't even have the ability to del deliver it on Tuesday because the people who are working on it work for a different co company in a different continent. So um, to get this done, when we actually did it, we, we worked with the Infra team, uh, we queued up things with the release manager, we kind of coordinated a big flag day with the community and said, okay, this is what's going to happen. One of the key things that actually enabled this is we had a big in-person meeting, and uh, it's, it, was, um, it, was, it was crucial for this to get everybody literally stand, standing in a circle saying, okay, are you going to be ready? Can you work on QA at your company? Can you do this? Are we going to be ready? Next Tuesday, we're going to hit merge. Everything's frozen. Are you going to start reviewing? And so we had to get all of these people lined up. So speaking of getting people lined up, you've got the release. And this is extremely hard to time releases in an open source world because you cannot hide things. It's not this big and one more thing like a big Apple reveal or something like this. Because the truth is, everybody knows everything you're working on. If anybody wanted to check, your mailing lists are public, your IRC logs are public, your code is public. So if anybody who has any, any shred of common sense wants to know what's going on, they can find out. Which means that you can't surprise people and say, ta-da, it's done, because they knew that already. <laughs> so the, the trick is, though, with the release is that there are a ton of non-devs involved. Um, all of the kind of fun people that stereotypically developers don't like to work with. The marketing, the PR, the press, people writing white papers, building videos, running webinars, writing blog posts, all of this kind of thing. They want to get queued up. And the lesson here is tell them early and often, as early as you can, as often as you can because they need to actually have a go, no-go ability. And they need to have things queued up so that when you thought it was going to release on Tuesday, but you know what? Sunday afternoon, you found this really big bug that really has to be patched, you can actually say, hold off. And they're, they're okay with that because you've been open and visible and doing that communication with people. So set those expectations and, and do that. So that's where you get. Now, the thing is, with the release, you release, and now you get to start all over. You get to sell everybody again. But this time, it's not the people who are working on it. You get to tell everybody else, and you start actually saying the same things you've been saying. But now it's, let me tell you about this new thing we've done, and let me tell you about what's going on. So the thing that's really nice here is tell people about use cases. Tell people about how it's actually useful. Don't tell them about the tech. You know, you're not very interested in, oh, here's all the, uh, the very specific uh, minutia of how we did data placement, and how we did the, you know, um, swapping things out and you know, reconciling things on an eventually consistent basis. That's not what people con are concerned about. They're concerned about uh, the fact that um, how do I use it? And so an important point here, and I'm going to have to speed through some of the rest of this, is that vision leaks. This is a phrase that I, uh, I learned from a uh, very good friend uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And the, the point is that unless people are continually reminded they're not going to have in front of them. This is why we're. This is why we're working. This is what we're working on, and this is why it's important. My vision for Swift is that everyone every day be using Swift, even if they do not realize it. And you'll be able to do this when you're doing your bank records, when you're looking, uh, you're watching videos, and when you're helping your kids with their homework. Um, this is the thing where people are using Swift today. So let's keep that in front of people and do that. So after the release, this is this is kind of the the. There was a big lull in activity, and I think that's okay because this is a massive effort. People refocus; uh, they need a break. That's okay, and their companies have been committing a lot of. Uh, they've been committing their people to this, but now they need to focus on some internal things. That's okay; it's normal. But at the same time, 
it's time to start over on the next feature. Internally, that's what you have to do, and then externally, you're, again, selling everything else. So this is, as a community manager running an open source project, this is where the second half of your job starts, is you've got to start dealing with everybody outside of the community. So I've got a very quick summary that I can go through here, is just random bullet points here. But the project moves forward, not your code. It's not important that your name is on Git Blame on this particular line of code. What's important is that the, the, the code itself is good and that together we're building something that is useful in production and that you can do that. So that requires a, a, a high degree of maturity. It's not your project, it's ours. It's the same thing. Somebody else might have a different idea and that's okay, so listen. But be courageous in your idea. Don't think that you don't have good ideas. Don't be afraid to speak up and, and work towards it. People have different motivations, and so you need to appeal to those motivations. And that's much more than a tech problem. So say thank you and promote others. Give contributors the tools that they need. And production makes silly problems go away. Really does not matter one bit on what little inside baseball political infighting you're dealing with in your open source project when the reality is you've got to manage 10,000 hard drives in production. Your, your focus changes when you actually have people paying you for the production system and that's the thing that matters. So uh, focus on the real problems, not on the little, the little distracting things. Sometimes it's not up to you. I mentioned the CI system was extremely slow. We couldn't do anything about that. And it was either wait literally months for our stuff to land or kind of go outside and do something different. So that's what we had to do. And we were lucky we were able to. Uh, people are looking for the ability to improve themselves. So help them do that. And then uh, sell that story to them. Sell the vision, share the vision, and continually remind them of it because that vision is going to leak. So looking forward, these are, the same, these are the lessons we learned in this kind of year-long effort among these massive amounts of developers. We're doing the same thing all over again. With building, by building on top of storage policies, we're building out uh, the next feature, which is erasure code support inside of OpenStack Swift. Uh, and we're going to take this. But the basic point is communication is key. Help people out. And it's, it's a fun journey. So I think we're just, I think we're out of time, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's a break time now. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, if you have any questions for me, I'm not my name on Twitter and IRC and uh, various other places. Um, so thank you. Question? Just one more. Thanks. Uh, well, the, the hijacking project was a mix of uh, corporate interest, sometimes involuntary, other times uh, it's a sort of industrial espionage. But uh, can you, uh, do you need to have a sort of benevolent dictator inside the project? I don't think you can. I do not think you can have a benevolent dictator. Uh, I mean, you sort of can, but the, the way you would do that is you would have one person with commit access or something like that. Uh, inside our policy inside of Swift specifically uh, for those core reviewers who have um, who have commit access, what that means is anybody can commit code, and it's not up to me. It's not up to any of the other core core developers. Uh, so there's there's not a single person who can control this. Our, our, our guidelines on selecting core contributors uh, include basically the question, would you be comfortable with this person pushing code to your production system while you're asleep? Mm -hmm. And if you are, then that's good. That's a good candidate for a core contributor. So I don't think it's required to have a dictator. I think it's very, very important to have somebody who can set vision and direction and break ties and give some leadership. But I don't think that that person needs to be uh, the person who says, we are going to do this, and you need to get in line. But isn't implicitly the organization, the benevolent dictator itself, in some way? I mean, the OpenStack Foundation to, is not the best analogy, but I mean, you, you have a frame, either a person or a superior entity. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be philosophical just to say, okay, we refer to this. <laughs> right. And the analogy with the Linux kernel, it's a little bit obvious. 
But uh, the, the, the open question is how often this happens or if it's required or not, you, you in some way answer. I, I, to be honest, I think it's, it depends a whole lot on the people mm -hmm. themselves who make up that mm -hmm. particular project. And in my experience, that has not been necessary. Mm -hmm. And as the project technical lead, I've never had to be dictatorial and mm -hmm. uh, keeping people in line or things like that. It's, it's been much more of a, this is what we're going to be doing and I'd love to hear what you're working on. And together we're collaboratively communicating to set mm -hmm. the overall direction. And so my, my job is more of, you're working on this piece, you're working on this piece, and together we're working on this. Mm -hmm. Rather than, you have to do this now, you have to do this now. So I, I think it's, it's specific, I have not seen that in my experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, final small is, question: yeah. The tools you choose them when you need them, or you before you start, you already have a certain tools, and then you. No, say, I think I think you use the tools. You find tools that work, and you use those. But don't try to go. In this particular case, I think we chose the tools we had and invented the new tools we needed because we needed them at the time. It wasn't because we ha we said you can choose these approved things. I think that's it's important to be able to have that flexibility. Anything else? That's it. John Tuckerson. Thank you. There you go. Thank you very much.